Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Tanya Brannigan spent several years in Beijing reporting for London's Guardian newspaper. Over her time there, she came to realize that the Cultural Revolution of 1966 to 76 was not a long forgotten piece of Chinese history, but a trauma that had been passed on to the generations that followed. Her new book, Red Memory, Living, Remembering, and Forgetting China's Cultural Revolution, profiles several individuals who survived the Cultural Revolution and have attempted to keep its memory and lessons alive, even as the Chinese government wishes only to look to the future. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Our guest this week is Tanya Brannigan. Her new book is Red Memory, Living, Remembering, and Forgetting China's Cultural Revolution. You tell readers in the beginning of your book that the idea for this came about over a cup of coffee. So tell me that story. It was extraordinary to me, really. I'd just gone out for a, a cup of coffee with a contact of mine, an entrepreneur, and investor. Uh, we had a chat about the usual politics in Beijing and what was going on and the economy. And then he just happened to mention over coffee this trip he'd made a few years before where he'd driven up to this village just outside Beijing in search of his father-in-law's body. And his father-in-law uh, was a very talented young man who'd committed suicide in the Cultural Revolution. His wife didn't remember her father at all. She was just a baby, but they'd been determined to try and bring him back home. And so they reached the village and the farmers there were pretty sympathetic. They actually remembered her father. They even remembered how quiet he'd been on the morning that he killed himself. Uh, he'd been held by Red Guards and had managed to escape and, and went to throw himself in front of a train. But when the family asked him how they could find the body, they were really just nonplussed and uncomprehending because they said, well, there are so many bodies there. How are we supposed to know which one was his? And there was something about that story that just really haunted me. I'd heard quite a lot about the Cultural Revolution already at that point, but I'd always really thought of it as history. And there was something about the fact that it was so immediate. It was a, a, a woman not much older than myself who'd grown up without a father, who had this just gap or absence in her life. It was so immediate it could come up over a cup of coffee. And at the same time, it was so commonplace that the farmers would say, well, why would you search for this body to lay it to rest? And so because of that, I think it really stayed with me in a way that even some of the more excessive stories, uh, some of the greater atrocities perhaps from the Cultural Revolution had, had not stayed with me in the same way. What were you doing in Beijing? I was then China correspondent for The Guardian. I'm now the foreign leader writer there. I write editorials. Uh, so I was very much concerned with what was new and what was changing. And obviously it was a place that was transforming itself at incredible speed. And so to many people, I think looking back seemed quite perverse. And certainly as a journalist, I felt my job was writing about what was new and what was changing. But what actually became clear to me in the weeks and months after that conversation was that the Cultural Revolution, although it seemed to be so far in the past, actually was everywhere just below the surface. So it wasn't generally discussed very much, both because of personal trauma and because of the way that it's been policed by the party state over the years. And yet it was always there just below the surface. And so I kept having these conversations, which I thought would be about the economy or about politics or about family relationships. And then quite quickly, I'd find that the conversation would turn back to this decade and turn back to that era of turbulence as people tried to make sense of their lives. So it might be a tycoon explaining why they had the drive to help them make their fortune. It might be somebody talking about why their family relationships had been so difficult and so turbulent. It might be an artist talking about his thirst for culture and how to make sense of that. But again and again, it would keep coming back to this era. And so it seemed as if the Cultural Revolution was, in a sense, almost nowhere in Chinese discourse, but everywhere at the same time once you started looking. What were the years that you were based in China? 
I was there from 2008. I went out at the start of the year in the run-up to the Olympics, and I left in 2015. So it was a time when China was really making its mark on the world uh, in a way it hadn't before. It had been clear it was on the rise, but obviously the Beijing Olympics were that sort of coming out party, which really cemented that point that China had returned to the forefront of the world. And at the time, it was a point where China was very confident. Uh, people were soon saying that China had saved the world in the financial crash because it invested so heavily. So there was a sense that perhaps China was the future. And as I said, it was a time of great transformation, a sense of real possibility. Things were changing and developing so fast. So it was a very exciting time to be there. At the same time, we saw this closing down of some of the space that people had sort of clawed out for themselves to have discussions, this space for civil society, for scholars. All of that began to be reined back in. And from 2012 onwards in particular, uh, when Xi Jinping took power, although it started before then, there was definitely a sense of things closing down again, uh, of a reining in of some of those possibilities. What was access like for you as a journalist and did it change over the years that you were there? It certainly became harder. Um, so it was always difficult and there were times when we'd be really welcomed by people. But one of the things that was actually hardest was when you wanted uh, to understand the official viewpoint and understand what the party state was doing and why, it was often actually harder to get that sort of access and do that kind of story because you needed to persuade officials that they could trust you. And that was something that they often felt very nervous about. Uh, and I think from their point of view, what they would see as uh, good coverage, they were always very keen on positive coverage, whereas we would always feel, I think, our job was to be objective in our coverage. So it was actually, in a way, hardest to write about what the party state was doing often, it was often easier to write about the things that the people were doing. And as I said, it was a country in such incredible flux. Uh, people often credit officials and the leadership with lifting the Chinese people out of poverty. But I think what we really saw was Chinese people clawing their way out of poverty and doing it through their own blood and sweat and doing an incredible job moving forward with this great hunger for life and this great hunger for change and transition and building a new life for themselves and, and for their families. So certainly access varied. There were times when people were very keen to talk to us, uh, perhaps because they had a problem that they were hoping to raise or resolve and they hoped that the publicity might help them. There were obviously often times particularly when it comes to more sensitive areas such as Tibet or Xinjiang, that it was much harder to get access and to be able to talk to people uh, without endangering sources, obviously. And then what we did as well see over that time period was as part of this sort of closing down, it did become much harder to report from there. Your book is a series of profiles of people who had a direct connection uh, to the Cultural Revolution. Before we get into some of them, I'd like to get up, very quickly get a few basic facts about Mao and the Cultural Revolution out for people who aren't so familiar with it. First of all, starting with Mao Zedong, what years did he rule China? So the Communist Party came to power in 1949 after it defeated the Guomindang in the Civil War. And Mao was in charge right up to his death in 1976. This, is, we saw, this is probably a big question, is how was he able to hold on to power for such a long time? He was very politically astute. He had obviously brought the party to power, which was a phenomenal achievement and managed to unite this very fractured country, which had been through many years of immense suffering, both at the hands of imperial powers, like Britain most notably with the Opium Wars, and then of course through this sort of disintegration, the warlord era, and then occupation by the Japanese, which was particularly brutal and painful. So for him to then come to power at the end of the Civil War, I think in itself was such a victory that it obviously gave him that incredible aura. But also right from the start, long before the communists came to power, he was very astute at 
pushing out and punishing and eradicating rivals and political opposition within the party. So there's certainly no doubt as well that it was a matter of ruling by fear too. Mao's Little Red Book, you tell readers, is the second most published book in the world after the Bible. If you could encapsulate his ideology or philosophy that is described in that book, how would you do that? Maoism really transforms traditional Marxism, not just because Mao believed that the peasantry could become the engine of revolution instead of the proletariat. And that, of course, was a pragmatic uh, decision because China hadn't transitioned to a sort of an era of great industry. But more profoundly, he really believed that instead of waiting for the economic conditions to be ripe, that people could strike out, that if they believed enough, if they pushed enough, if they were struggled enough, if they were pure enough, that they could create this perfect communist society. You didn't have to wait for the right conditions. That thought, in some sense, was really enough to transform society. And this is an ideology that really reaches its zenith in the Cultural Revolution, but it's certainly evident before that as well. Well, his first major policy was the Great Leap Forward, and you report that as many as 45 million people died from famine as a result of this policy. What was its intention? It was an act of extraordinary hubris, really. So Mao sought to collectivize agriculture pushing farmers into these large communes and also to transform industry. He wanted to leapfrog the UK in terms of industrial production. But really, of course, he was also concerned with overtaking the Soviet Union. He wanted China to be the standard bearer for international communism. So this was his great idea and it went disastrously wrong. It had to be reined back in uh, by pragmatists. And so Mao was very concerned for his authority, although there was no doubt that he was still at the top. Uh, certainly, there was a sense that his supremacy had been damaged, his authority had been damaged. Uh, as I said, pragmatists in the party had reined him in, and he was extremely unhappy about that. I think that was a, a pragmatic issue from his point of view, that he wanted, of course, to retain that absolute power. He was looking to the Soviet Union where Khrushchev had denounced Stalin following his death. So he was thinking about his legacy as well. He felt vulnerable. Uh, and at the same time, he seems to have had this belief that if only people had believed enough, we go back to this idea of Maoism as, as ideas almost being enough. If only people had been pure enough and had struggled enough, that it would all have been all right. And we see, even from the point that the Communist Party comes to power in 1949, Mao talking about his fears that people will be sort of corrupted by being in power, that the bourgeoisie's influence, what he calls the sugar-coated bullets of the bourgeoisie, will taint and corrupt the party. So when he launches the Cultural Revolution, it's absolutely a power play to eradicate opposition. But he also is trying to create this perfect communist utopia. And he does that by turning to young people. He can't use the party anymore. There's this opposition in the party. So he goes out to the masses and especially to the young people, teenagers, as young as 13 or 14 in many cases, who become his sort of shock troops to carry out this revolution. You write that a defining moment of the Cultural Revolution was an August 18th, 1966 rally in uh, what we call Red Square, Tiananmen Square. Uh, what happened that day and why did it launch the movement? It was the moment that really showed what Mao wanted. So there had certainly been opening shots already. Going back some months, Mao had begun to move against people in the party. Uh, that he wanted out of the way, and people who were un people who were in the circles around more powerful figures he was hoping to take down. He'd also issued a notification that had told people within the top ranks of the party, look, I believe that we've been corrupted, we've got revisionists within the ranks, we have to root them out, and this is a problem that goes right through our society, right through culture. This has got to be this fundamental change. But that rally was the first time that the message had really been taken out to the public in that way. 
And the Red Guard groups, which had begun to spring up rather tentatively, were given the mark of Mao's approval. So it really lights the fuse on the whole Cultural Revolution. It makes it not just a party matter, but a Beijing-wide and soon uh, a universal matter. At that event, there were hundreds of thousands of Red Guards crammed into Tiananmen Square. They were waiting for him. Mao doesn't actually speak. It's one of the things about the way he uses his power. He's often very good at using that sort of silence and that ambiguity. But they're told by Lin Biao, who's one of the key figures of the Cultural Revolution, that they need to go out and smash the four olds. They need to go out and smash up the old ways, the old customs, the old ways of doing things. And at the same time, a young Red Guard from one of the elite schools climbs up to the rostrum and she's allowed on and allowed to give Mao a Red Guard armband. And his acceptance really signals that the Red Guards are now at the top of the world, uh, in, in the words of one of my interviewees, that they're in charge, that they can, can and should go out in this very radical, brutal, transformative action. Are there any estimates as to how many young people ultimately joined the Red Guard? It's very hard to say, but certainly many millions were involved and drawn in. It was a very complex pr process. It started really at the top of the party with the children of the elites being involved. It soon became much more widespread. We then saw fracturing of Red Guard groups, that factions would turn upon each other. And then after a few years, even Mao would decide he'd really have had, had enough of this chaos uh, and that the Red Guards had served their purpose, of course, which was reigning in opposition to him. Uh, and at that stage, he got the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, to rein them back in and 17 million young people were sent off to the countryside over the following years to get them out of the cities. I think uh, before we get too farther into the story, it's important to tell the audience that the current leader of <clears throat> China, Xi Jinping, his family and he himself were caught up in the Cultural Revolution. What's his story? I think it really exemplifies the way that the Cultural Revolution touched everybody from the top leaders in Beijing right down to families in very remote areas of the country. It, we saw both of Mao's two heirs apparent die in the Cultural Revolution, and Xi's father had in fact been disgraced or had fallen from favour uh, before the Cultural Revolution even started. But the persecution of the family then became much more intense in that era. So his father was repeatedly struggled against and denounced. Uh, she himself was subjected to struggle sessions. We're told that his mother was ordered to denounce him. Uh, his sister, his elder sister, would eventually commit suicide, we believe, because of the persecution and pressure that the family had endured. And she himself would spend seven years living in the countryside in these very grueling rural conditions. So he, like so many people in his generation, has been deeply shaped and scarred by his experiences. How is that story told in Xi's biography or when he talks about it? Well, it's fascinating because this is the one part of the Cultural Revolution that officialdom is willing and even keen to talk about, almost celebrate. So this period of 17 million children and youths being sent down to the countryside, and I think it's hard for us to imagine now what that means, but they weren't just going hundreds of miles away from home for life, they believed at the time. They were really almost going back a century. They were going into these very primitive crude conditions, no electricity, no running water, perhaps to villages that couldn't be reached by road. They were trying to scrape a living, knowing nothing about farming. Uh, many of them lost their lives due to diseases or work accidents. I mean, it was a really tough, tough time. And so I think it's striking that the party state has now managed to celebrate this as really being a time of honest toil, of comradeship. And certainly it's something that she himself has been very keen to talk about, this idea that this is where he became a man, uh, that he endured this hardship and came through, that it's made him stronger. And so 
I think the key messages from the authority's point of view are that he's somebody who knows what it's like to be right at the bottom of society. And clearly he does have some idea of that in a way that many leaders in the West might not. He's really lived through it. Uh, but also that he was somebody who learned from his experiences, that he was somebody who wasn't afraid to work hard and to toil, and that he worked alongside the villagers and tried to help them up. So it's also part of this story of this rather benevolent figure helping others out as he goes along. And so it's celebrated even as the rest of the story of the Cultural Revolution is really swept away. But of course, it's celebrated in a very partial way. So there's never any discussion of why he had to go to the countryside, why all these young people were there. It's almost presented as this wholesome experience where everybody could get back to the land. Nobody's talking about the violence and the chaos that preceded it or, or how harrowing it really was for young people. And in fact, many of the villagers were not very welcoming of these young people coming in their midst, you report. Uh, so uh, what would a typical, if there is such a thing, a typical experience have been like for someone like Xi uh, coming into the middle of a village with absolutely no modern facilities available? It was incredibly tough. I mean, by modern standards, their life in Beijing might not have been luxurious, but compared to what they faced in the villages, it was just incomparable. Uh, in many cases, people told me even things like oil or salt for cooking just became regarded as such luxuries. Uh, often they couldn't understand the people around them. The same was true for she because of the local dialects and so forth. So even managing to make yourself understood could be incredibly tough. Uh, villagers, as you say, often weren't particularly welcoming. They just saw these people as an extra mouths to feed and not particularly helpful. The, the theoretical rationale was that young people would bring all their skills from the city to help the countryside. And then from the peasantry, they learn more about the true nature of revolution and how to be good communists. But the reality was simply that these city kids were going down there to places which really were so far behind their times and that they just had no way of changing or making an impact on. And so even people who'd been very idealistic when they went, in many cases, grew bitter and disillusioned within weeks of their arrival. As I said, people died in accidents, people uh, died of illnesses. There is, in fact, this genuine grassroots nostalgia, which I think gave birth to this sort of official vision, because people remember it as being a sort of bittersweet time. It was their youth. They think, well, perhaps we did learn lessons from it. But it was certainly a very, very tough time. Well, let's move from Xi, the leader, to the stories, some of the stories that you tell in your book of, of people that were involved or impacted by the Cultural Revolution. Let me start with Yu Zhang Zhen who was in her 60s when you met her. Uh, how old was she at the time of the Cultural Revolution? She was only 13 or 14 when the Cultural Revolution broke out in Beijing. And like many of the very young people at the time, they were often the most idealistic in a way. And what was her part? What role did she play in the Cultural Revolution? She joined a Red Guard group very early on. She'd grown up in Beijing, so really on the fringes, I think you could say, of the political elite. Her family were relatively high up officials. And so she was used to sort of mixing with the children of politicians at schools and at school and so forth. And her school quite quickly formed a Red Guard group, which she joined. She remembers immense excitement, particularly on the day of that rally in Tiananmen Square, that sense that they were really going out to change the world, but also, of course, excitement, because these were young kids who were certain, suddenly told that they didn't need to be in school. They were hugely idealistic. They believed they were doing the work of Chairman Mao, this man they'd been brought up to revere and worship. They were seeing teachers in some cases that they'd had difficulties with, being torn down, struggled against, criticized, abused. And they had this sort of liberation. I mean, at one stage, uh, she was one of the people who went traveling right around the country to spread the word of revolution. Uh, and in her words, it, it was really a holiday as much as it, it was a mission because they were getting to travel to these beauty spots and see all of China in a way that they'd never imagined possible. But at the same time, she was really wrapped by guilt 
really from the start about some of the horrors that she was witnessing. So when members of the Red Guard groups, for example, were beating up a bourgeois family in front of her, she declined to take part. What was very striking about that is that when she spoke about it, she didn't say, well, I knew it was wrong. Uh, she said, you know, I, I felt it was wrong and I didn't want to do it and it wasn't the way that I'd been brought up and so I refused. But at the same time, she said, she really had questions in her mind about whether she simply wasn't brave enough. Was she not a true believer enough? So it was a very, very conflicted experience right from the very beginning. And in many ways, a very traumatizing experience. She spoke to me, for example, about seeing the corpses of people who'd been beaten to death by Red Guards. It was a horrifying time for many young people, even at the same time that in some ways it was also exciting or liberating in a way that perhaps we find hard to understand. This was a, a pretty poignant description of that very first summer, Red August. You write that the summer of violence was worse than Lord of the Flies. And it happened in the midst of civilization, one that was founded in large part on respect for scholars, elders, and authorities. So ultimately, what role did she play? And I guess the big question is, by the time you spoke to her all these years later, how was she processing that role? It seemed to me that she, like many of the people I spoke to, remained very traumatized by her experiences. I think many people are still struggling to understand what happened. The one thing that unites all the people in Red Memory are that they are people who have kept the memory of the Cultural Revolution alive in some sense, even as so many others have tried to forget it. So she still feels guilt uh, about the people that she denounced and so forth, even though she drew back from physical violence. She feels conflicted, really, about what led to it. She has a real urge to try and understand what drove people to it. And certainly that was something that was a very common instinct among people I spoke to, trying to understand this event that really in many ways is impossible to understand not just because it lasted 10 years and there were these successive waves of different events and violence and political countercurrents, but also because of the sheer enormity of it, the, the horror of what happened in that time. To introduce the, the next profile, I want to play a little bit of music and you'll explain to our audience why I am playing this. <laughs> Tanya Brownigan, that is composer Wang Zilin. Did I say his name correctly? Wang Xilin. Xilin. And uh, he was an adult at the time of the Cultural Revolution. What was his story? He was, like many people caught up in these events, somebody who'd been hugely idealistic. So he'd joined a PLA performance troupe at the age of around 12 or so. He'd risen up through the ranks. He was politically very zealous and also very talented. And then he made the disastrous mistake of thinking that he could criticize the party's policies on the arts shortly before the Cultural Revolution started. As a result of that, he was politically persecuted and he was sent into exile. And when the Cultural Revolution started, he was really at the front of the queue for punishment, you could say. People were looking for targets, and obviously somebody who already had a black mark against his name was really going to be first in line. He was very brutally abused, both verbally and physically. He came very close to death. At one point, he was taken from the shed where he was being held, uh, buried up to his neck in soil. Um, he was 
beaten, dragged around. He thought he would die uh, in exile, and so many of the people he was there with did. And somehow, despite that, he survived uh, and even thrives uh, today. He was rescued rather oddly because local leaders wanted to put on a model opera, which were one of the very few art forms available in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, the joke has it that there were 800 million people watching eight model operas. So there was this very limited repertoire of shows uh, put on by Mao's wife, Zhang Xing. She was really at the helm of that. And Wang Xilin was recruited to put on a local version of one of these shows, and that really saved his life. From there, he would eventually return to Beijing. And then many years later, having finally won the approval of officialdom again, he was asked to write a Millennium Symphony. And he did. Uh, but being a very honest man and a very straightforward man, he stood up at the dress rehearsal and said that he thought the key moment of the 20th century had been the rise of communism and its fall. That meant, of course, that his symphony was never performed. And he was really back into disgrace once more for many years. He's an extraordinary man. He's now living in exile in Germany. He has an extraordinary thirst for life. And I know he will be absolutely delighted that you have played his music because he really wants people to hear the music that he had to hide and conceal for so long. I want to tell people if they're interested. We, we found it on YouTube, as you can find so many things, and there are very long pieces uh, by him that you can listen to. How would you describe his music? Well, I am not a musicologist, um, but it's certainly very clear that he's taken the influence of some of the great composers like Schoenberg and Penderecki, and then he's fused it actually with the music that he heard while he was living in exile in the countryside. And so he has drawn upon the forces that he encountered in the Cultural Revolution itself to make this music that also embraces the kind of music that was judged dangerous, foreign, um, uncommunist in the Cultural Revolution and that would have put him in grave danger. And with it, he's made this sound that is really his own. So I see his story as really being about this unlikely uh, but remarkable flourishing, not only despite the trauma he'd endured, but it's also really a story of the way that culture and the arts have, in China have flourished, not just in spite of this 10 years of sort of blankness where foreign arts and any radical arts at all were completely outlawed, but also in this sense of people drawing upon the time and finding new power and enthusiasm and passion for the art precisely because they were denied culture for so long. We have 25 minutes left to go in our hour with Tanya Brannigan. Her new book is called Red Memory, Living, Remembering and Forgetting China's Cultural Revolution. One of the many poignant notes in his uh, his story was uh, that you write that he composed his first symphony in his late teens and it was hidden in the bottom of a tub of rice by, for decades by friends. What kind of risk were they taking in hiding his music? Oh, immense, absolutely immense. And he says himself, it's sort of remarkable that they did so. It was really a time when books were being pulped and burned, sculptures were being smashed, things were set fire to in the streets. It was a time when external influences were really so forbidden and dangerous or work by somebody who'd transgressed in the way that he had just to be associated with somebody who was seen as having strayed was in itself incredibly dangerous. So yes, that too speaks to the courage that people showed. And also the instinct for solidarity that sometimes could survive in these very, very troubled and difficult circumstances. Next uh, profile is Wang Jinyao. And it's the story really of his wife, Teacher Bian. Tell me that story, please. She was the first victim of the Cultural Revolution in Beijing. She was a teacher who was beaten to death by her students, teenage girls. And her story in many ways really has come to symbolize so much of what happened in that time. 
Nobody has ever been punished for what happened to her. The girls who initially began the criticism against her uh, have since apologised. That was an apology that Wang Jingyao felt that he simply could not accept. But the story really captures, I think, the cruelty of the time. It's not just the fact that her own students turned upon her for these imagined crimes that she clearly hadn't committed, sort of thought crimes essentially. It's not just the fact that she was beaten to death, but then even when people did take her to hospital, in fact, the girls who had originally criticised her eventually took her, um, her, or as she was suffering, they took her uh, unconscious to hospital. But the fact they then arrived there and nobody was even willing to treat her because they thought that treating her might put themselves in danger as somehow being a class enemy. And what really stood out about this was the fact that Wang Jingyao insisted on remembering. He couldn't do it openly, but he bought a camera the day after her death and he took photographs of her wounds. He took photographs of everything that had been done to her, uh, of the posters that had been put around her house denouncing her in the days leading up to her death. He gathered all this information. Uh, he had a sort of shrine to her which was kept in a cupboard so the family knew it was there but nobody else could see it was there. He even kept her bloodied clothes in a suitcase under the bed because he knew it was dangerous to keep these things but he thought it was so vital not only, I think, to do justice to the memory of his wife and to try and win justice for her, but also more broadly to remind people to have the proof of what happened in the Cultural Revolution, to be able to tell people what happened in this era, not just immediately, but in the years to come. In uh, the mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, he participated in a documentary with the title Though I Am Gone, released in 2006 by Hugh G. And uh, I want to play a clip of it. It's about 54 minutes long. It's in Chinese with uh, subtitles, translation as well. So let's listen. Several days before, she took a shower at home. She said she would rather clean her body before being beaten to death. I suggested her leaving Beijing, but she said, I have done nothing wrong. She would rather die than lose her dignity. She knew she was in danger, but she believed she was innocent. She preferred to die in dignity than to leave Beijing because she was, she was knew she was innocent. How did that, that hearing that story affect your understanding of what happened in the Cultural Revolution? I think the sheer brutality of it is key to understanding what happened in that time. I think trying to understand the minds of her pupils, as impossible as that seems to us, you quoted the passage where I say it wasn't Lord of the Flies, because actually this happened in the middle of Beijing, but also this was really being done on the orders of Chairman Mao, people believed. There was a sense that it was time for the whole of society to be uprooted. Young people had been brought up to revere Mao. They had been brought up with this very strong sense of struggle, of a country being under threat. And of course, in many ways, that was true. Uh, the Guomindang was still in Taiwan, hoping to come back and recapture the mainland. And there was a sense of external enemies, of the US uh, waiting to support the Guomindang, of course, of the Soviet Union, relations there had deteriorated so badly with the Sino-Soviet split. So there was a real sense of things being under threat. There was a sense that the whole culture that they'd grown up with was so martial. It was about being willing uh, to go to extremes in a sense, to 
to do the right thing in their view. And you also have people who in many cases, I think, probably are quite traumatized through their families by the experiences of the previous decades. So it's very hard for us to understand in its extremity, but part of understanding it is really trying to look at the roots of this. Uh, and then the other aspect of it, of course, is simply the fact that Wang Jingyao, like others, refused to forget. And so up to the end of his life, he was insistent that his wife's story really should be remembered. By the time he participated in, in uh, 2005, 2006, was it dangerous for him to sit in front of a camera and tell a story? There have been really waves of, um, there have really been waves of discussion, I would say, in China. So in the immediate aftermath of the Cultural Revolution, there was suddenly this outburst of what's often talked of as scar literature, which is this wave of memoirs and novels, people talking about what they'd endured in that time. Uh, more often, compared to recent years, more often focusing on what had been done to them rather than what they'd done to other people. Um, but the part of the leadership really found that quite useful. In some ways, it stressed that they were drawing a line under what happened. It was cathartic. And it also really helped to explain why the party was suddenly abandoning Maoism after all these years and turning towards the market and a very different uh, political and economic outlook. So it was tolerated then. Over the years, it's become harder. Um, the documentary is one of a number of extraordinary historical films that have been made by Hu Jie, who's done these remarkable historical documentaries on very tricky subjects. So it's certainly something that was sensitive and you would never in a million years see on cinemas uh, in cinemas or on television in China. Um, but Hu Jie and others have been able to do that kind of work within limits. But again, that's something that has become more restricted in recent years. For example, there was a ban that was sort of issued to publishing houses saying, don't put out works on the Cultural Revolution, histories and handbooks and so forth. One final profile, and that is Zhang Hangming. And this is a story of a son who turned on his own mother. Can you tell me it? Zhang Hongbing was just 17 when he denounced his mother. His family had been through a very turbulent time in the Cultural Revolution, and his mother had been denounced. His father was initially denounced first. His sister had died after going to one of the mass rallies held by Mao. Uh, she died of meningitis, which had been really an epidemic sparked or certainly spread very rapidly by all the Red Guards traveling around. So there was a sense of quite a fragile family, I think. He nonetheless was still a true believer in the cause. And when his mother, who by that stage, I think must have been quite a broken woman, she'd been held for a couple of years uh, for her supposed political crimes again, his, his mother was finally allowed to return home and she began to speak out against and criticise Chairman Mao. He and his father then went to the authorities to denounce her, knowing full well that she would be executed. And so she was shortly afterwards. So he has spent his life living with this knowledge. His mother was rehabilitated in the years after the Cultural Revolution, like many of its victims. Uh, that was really a sort of lobbying effort led by his uncle. But then more recently, Zhang Hongbing began to talk about his mother's case because he wanted to preserve her grave, which was under threat from redevelopment. And that's how I came to meet him. But what a strange scene you describe when he took you to her gravesite. Mother, I've brought the guardian. How did you how did you react to that? I think it's very hard for us to put ourselves in the minds of people who are having to live with these decade long traumas uh, and sense of guilt and sense of repentance. It was very clear to me that he was trying to give us, I suppose, what he felt we wanted um, as a news organization. And what I was hoping to understand was really what mattered to him 
and what was central to his viewpoint. And that was something that I think I found harder to discern as we talked. One of the quotes I, I uh, copied from your chapter to have you talk about uh, in his story, one thing was more terrifying than a stranger, someone close to you. Those who knew you best had the greatest power to harm. And when you cannot trust those beside you, trust itself was destroyed. You have more to say on that? I think it was really devastating to those relationships that people had to the fabric of society in China itself, already ruptured in some ways, as I say, by these many traumas that the society had been through. But then this series of betrayals, often by people so close to you, could be your spouse, could be a friend, could be a workmate, and that sense of perpetual vulnerability that you never knew whether you were safe both because the political winds kept changing and because you simply didn't know who to trust. And I think that has been something very damaging that not only broke these very profound Confucian bonds that still persisted in society between parent and child, for example, but also even these newer communist ideals of fraternity and so forth were suddenly snapped because it was the people who knew you best who had the most material to damage you with, in a sense. And you would also be the person to hand if they came under suspicion and needed to save themselves. It's important to say that many people didn't uh, denounce their relatives or that they did so under extreme duress. It was rare to go to the authorities of your own account. But it was a time when certainly people simply didn't feel safe, even perhaps with their spouses. And even in the aftermath, the physio... Uh, even in the aftermath, a, a psychotherapist told me that people wouldn't talk about it with people they knew. They wouldn't talk about what had happened in the Cultural Revolution with people they worked with, for example, but they might talk about it to a stranger on a train because somehow that seemed safer. So moving from these stories to the national memory, uh, you, you, uh, we saw that the, the Communist Party abandoned Maoism and turned toward uh, economic power um, <clears throat> and growth. But if you go to Beijing today and visit Tiananmen Square, the most impactful thing is the enormous portrait of Chairman Mao. And uh, I believe it's still the case that his body is enshrined in one of the buildings in Red Square in a crystal sarcophagus for people to come by. Uh, why is it that he remains such an important cultural touch point when they rejected his philosophy? I think in some ways it helped them to make that rather radical turn because they still embraced him. It allowed them to actually step away from what he was doing without explicitly betraying him and his legacy. So I think in some ways that was quite a pragmatic choice. I think at the same time, people have talked about what they call China's Lenin and Stalin problem. So in the Soviet Union, people were able to say, you know, Lenin uh, was wonderful. He got so many things right. It was all going great. And then Stalin came along and he's the one who ruined things. In China, you only have one leader and that's Mao. So you can't really target uh, the second part of Mao, without, but not the first part. You can't really um, shun him without cutting off the very roots of the party and its whole story about how it rose to power. But I also think there's really something more fundamental, which is that once you allow people to judge past leaders, you're implicitly granting them the right to make judgments about leaders per se. And that means that they may well judge you too. So you tried to visit uh, places where the cultural revolution story might be told, a private museum, for example, a grave site that held a number of graves of, of young people. Uh, teenagers who were participants and victims of it. What is the official line and how open are the uh, Chinese officials in telling the Cultural Revolution story today? So the party said that the Cultural Revolution was a catastrophe. That's the official verdict. And that Mao was really led astray by the Gang of Four. So it was all the fault of these leftist zealots, uh, his wife, Jiang Qing, and others. But that verdict was itself drawn up as a way of really adding a full stop to events. 
So even when Deng Xiaoping told, when he took over uh, in the years after Mao's death, he he told people to draft this verdict, but he made it clear that the purpose of it was to unite people and to look ahead. It was never about the kind of memorialization we might think of where you say, this terrible thing happened and therefore we must remember this forever. We mustn't forget it. There's a lesson there for us. It was very much about drawing a line and moving on. As I say, partly justifying the party's shift towards the market, but also saying, look, that's over and done with. We don't want to dwell on this. And in the years that have followed, discussion has really become more and more policed over the years. Uh, it ha- the party hasn't walked away from that verdict of it being a catastrophe, but most of the time it simply just doesn't talk about it at all. So, for example, I went to the uh, exhibition in the National Museum of China, which is supposed to tell the story of how the Communist Party really rescued China and brought it to greatness. It's the official verdict of the story of modern China. There is a room which is very small, which is called sort of setbacks on the way to communism. And there was this sort of one very small picture in the corner, which showed people celebrating after the fall of the Gang of Four. So it wasn't even remembering the Cultural Revolution as such. It was addressing very briefly and very tangentially what had happened afterwards. And that's really quite typical that it's not denied. It's not totally taboo in the way that something like the crackdown on 1989's pro uh, reform protests in Tiananmen Square would be, but it is very sensitive and increasingly so. When I started writing this book, I spoke to somebody who was telling me about a professor who was not allowed to teach a course on the Cultural Revolution, but he did get approval to teach a course called Chinese Culture 1966 to 76, which as everybody knows there is the other dates of the Cultural Revolution. So there was this sense of some kind of leeway, uh, some sort of space that people could use. That's become much more narrow. Xi Jinping has put history right at the center of his story, this narrative of the Communist Party rescuing China. And that's meant much more careful control of the historical narrative. Within months of coming to power, he made it clear to top leaders that what he called historical nihilism was an existential peril to the party on a par with things like Western democracy. And I think this is quite hard for us to understand, but that story is really so much of what has given the party its legitimacy, uh, particularly after the disasters of the Cultural Revolution. And then after 1989, it was very hard to defend this idea that it was there to serve the people. The economic benefits it brought, indisputable, but they've gradually ebbed over the years. The outlook now is much trickier. And so this historical narrative has become much more important and therefore defending it and cracking down on alternative narratives has also become much more essential. We've seen laws tightened. We've seen even a hotline for reporting acts of historical nihilism. We have about five minutes left. Is it possible for you to say what lessons Xi has absorbed from Mao's leadership style to apply to his own? I think it's interesting that people so often draw these parallels between Xi and Mao. Certainly, you can see some parallels in the sense of this embryonic, burgeoning personality cult, people celebrating the leader in a way that hasn't been done for years. Most obviously, he's swept away these conventions of term limits. So he's there indefinitely. He's seen off uh, rivals. So he's clearly the most powerful leader since Mao himself. But the differences are in many ways as striking, I think. So we have somebody who believes much more in order in discipline. And I think one has to imagine that that's very much the result of his own experiences in the Cultural Revolution. There's a striking sort of irony because his father and other party elders tried to put these safeguards in place. You couldn't have one dominant strongman at the top, and he's obviously swept those away. But at the same time, he obviously sees the Cultural Revolution as a time of chaos and turmoil that has to be safeguarded against. So in some ways, he's actually strengthened the party as much as he's strengthened his own grip. And that's very different. What is interesting is that not so much the people I interviewed in Red Memory, but people just in the last few years 
have spoken more and more about the parallels with the Cultural Revolution. Uh, we've seen a scholar give a very outspoken essay talking about the parallels between Xi and Mao. And then more recently, when we saw the protests against zero COVID, people were actually holding up signs saying uh, reform, not the Cultural Revolution. So it's interesting that even within China, for all the differences, people do see some echo of the past there. But I would also hope that people really look beyond China to the lessons it bears for people elsewhere as well. If you think of powerful, disruptive figures trying to enlist the masses with very divisive, destructive uh, messages, emotionally resonant with them to overthrow the status quo, it seems to me there are very obvious parallels throughout the West, Donald Trump most obviously, but certainly not ending there. And what were your own reflections in working on this book about uh, the life you are able to enjoy living in London compared to the lives that the people that you wrote about live? Well, I think because I write about foreign policy, I am very aware of how profoundly lucky anybody is to live in a stable society, but also very aware of how easy it is to take these things for granted, um, aware of how our own societies have a very partial version of their own history. So certainly when I was growing up, I didn't learn about how much Britain benefited from chattel slavery and the plantation system. I learned all about how Britain abolished slavery. Uh, so it made me very aware of the partial stories that we tell ourselves. And it also made me aware of how fragile the safeguards are and how human nature encompasses both remarkable things, but also terrible instincts and how easy it is for those instincts to be allowed off the leash. And so I hope it's really taught me to be careful, I suppose. It makes me think we should all be more careful, more aware of the dangers and how much harm can be done when these things are allowed to develop. The book is titled Red Memory, Living, Remembering, and Forgetting China's Cultural Revolution. Tanya Brannigan, thank you so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Remember, if you subscribe to this podcast, you'll never miss an episode. And I'd really like to hear from you about our interviews. You can email me at podcasts, that's podcast with an S, at c-span.org. Your feedback is welcome.